1960, uh, a young uh, Jewish American woman from the suburbs of Connecticut uh, named Elaine Klein struck up a friendship with uh, Franz Fanon, uh, a traveling ambassador for the Algerian National Liberation Front at a political conference in Ghana. They went dancing, they talked about the Algerian Revolution. And at one point, uh, Fanon asked her what she wanted in a relationship. And she said, to put my head on someone's shoulder. No, he replied. Stay upright on your own two feet and keep moving forward to goals of your own. Elaine Klein, now Elaine Moktefi, took Fanon's advice to heart. Already a left-wing activist, she began working in New York for the Algerian provisional government when she returned to New York City. And after independence, she offered her services to the post-revolutionary government. When Eldridge Cleaver and his comrades in, uh, in the Black Panthers arrived in Algiers in 1969, Elaine became their liaison with the Algerian authorities, an indispensable interlocutor and interpreter of a country they never managed or bothered to understand. The qualities that so deeply impressed the Algerians and the Black Panthers, courage, resilience, compassion, modesty, a revolutionary idealism tempered with, sub with political sobriety, infuse her memoir, Algiers, Third World Capital. Elaine's book is on one level a gripping caper of revolutionary activism, clandestine meetings, fratricidal violence, airplane hijackings, commitment and betrayal. Uh, it opens a rare and intimate window onto the politics of revolutionary third world, third worldism and black power, but it's also, I think, a love story. There is above all, a Elaine's love of justice, but there's also her love of the Algerian people whom she never confuses with their leadership. There's also her the love of the man who became her husband, Mokhtar Moktefi, an Algerian Liberation War veteran, uh, whose memoir, J'étais Français, Français Musulman, was published just after his death three years ago. There's even a, a kind of love, a difficult love, for Eldridge Cleaver, a man whose virtues she recalls and honors in spite of all he did to squander and betray them. Uh, I met Elaine and her late husband, Mokhtar, four years ago when we were introduced by an Algerian writer living in New York, Amara Lakus. Mokhtar was a tall, handsome, world-weary man, courtly and charming, with the air of someone who had many secrets, an impression abundantly <laughs> confirmed by his memoir. Elaine was and is soft-spoken but forceful, tender, and tough. She had not been to Algeria since the early 1970s when she was expelled, but Algeria remained close to her heart as it did to Mokhtar's. I realized then that she was Elaine Klein, a woman I'd read about in a 1969 article in the New York Times Magazine by the French-American journalist Ted Morgan, a profile of Eldridge Cleaver, our man in Havana. What a life she led. I didn't know the half of it. Not long after our meeting, Elaine sent me her manuscript. I devoured it. Here is someone who's seen and helped make history, and her book is full of portraits and cameos, Fanon, Ben Bella, Eldridge and Kathleen Cleaver, Simone de Beauvoir, Timothy Leary, Archie Shep, Nina Simone, Marion McCabe, Stokely Carmichael. But what I also love about the book is the way it captures Elaine's journey, her awakening as an activist and as a woman with both detachment and passion, flashes of wit and sorrow. Elaine barely writes about herself, and yet she provides us with a touching self-portrait. With rare exceptions, memoirs of revolutionary third world politics and of the Black Panthers have been either doctrinaire apologias or equally self-serving acts of renunciation. Elaine is not writing to defend her past, still less to disavow it, but rather to record what she witnessed, what she experienced and felt, and to remind us that Algeria, black liberation, and the third world, what they meant to her generation without papering over the mistakes, the crimes, the corruptions that plague these movements as they do all revolutionary causes, but also with, without bitterness or rancor. It took Elaine years to write this book and a few more years of frustration as she looked for a publisher. There were dozens of letters from editors who said they could not imagine an audience for the book. The book is selling very well. <laughs> um, delighted to be here with you, Elaine, and I'd ask everyone to give you a round of applause. Um, thanks. I'm, I'm delighted to be here. Um, I talk about Algeria and France. 
But first, I'd like to say something about uh, Adam. Um, first and foremost, uh, there wouldn't have been a book without Adam. Uh, when he saw how desperate I was, <laughs> he suggested that I write an article for the London Review of Books, and he introduced me to the chief editor. And that was the entrance into Verso, that article. Um, I want to talk mainly about the end of the Algerian War, which actually occurred in the summer of 1962, after seven and one half years. The ending months uh, were dramatic. Some of them were even ludicrous. That end has been forgotten. And I do believe it should be remembered since the role that nations and individuals can play is in varied circumstances is not only tricky but underestimated. How carelessly we enter into war with slogans and exaggerations and lies and with what difficulty we leave war behind. The first event I wish to remind you of is the Paris massacre of October 17, 1961. On orders from the Parisian police chief at the time, Maurice Papon, the French police attacked a peaceful demonstration of Algerians. It is estimated that there were 30,000 who stepped out of their shanty towns on the rim of Paris to protest against a curfew inflicted upon them and around the city, as well as conditions in Algeria. Hundreds died. They were beaten savagely to death, as well as thrown into the River Seine to drown, all by members of the French police. Maurice Papon directed the October 17, 1961 massacre personally. Police records show that he called for officers to be, quote, subversive, and that they would be, quote, protected. Between 7,500 and 10,000 Algerians were arrested that night. After 36 years, 37 years of denial and censorship of the press, in 1998, 37 years later, the French government finally acknowledged 30 deaths, although most estimates are in the hundreds, around 400. Maurice Papon had been police chief in Bordeaux during the Vichy collaborationist government of the Second World War. Papon was only tried for his collusion with the Nazis and his role in Vichy in 1998, the same year that the French government acknowledged that there had been a massacre in Paris in 1961. He was charged finally with crimes against humanity for his role in deporting more than 1,600 Jews to concentration camps during Vichy. He was not condemned for the, French, for the Paris massacre. The second event I'd like to recall took place in April 1961, shortly before. In 1961, de Gaulle's government had finally begun official negotiations with the FLN, with the National Liberation Front of Algeria, to end the war. On April 21st of that year, four French army generals, Charles, Jouot, Salon, and Zeller, staunch supporters of French Algeria and just as strongly opposed to the negotiations, decided to attack first Algeria and then France. And when I say attack, I mean militarily, to take over the government of France and the rest. They started by closing down Algiers, taking control of the city. They announced in public that their command unit had decided to reconstitute constitutional, constitutional and republican order that had been seriously compromised by a government whose illegality shines brightly in the eyes of the nation, unquote. During that night, of April 21st, the 1st Parachute Division took control of the main strategic points in the city of Algiers, the town hall, the radio, the airport, and the seat of government. The Pichists were about 1,000 men, representing uh, the French military machine in Algeria, which was estimated at the time at 500,000, including paramilitary forces and police. In Paris, 
purchased information had been streaming in from different sources, and the top Parisian cop, again, Maurice Platon, whose reputation as complicit with the Nazis I've just spoken about, has set up a crisis desk in a room of the Comédie Française, because de Gaulle happened to be at the theater with Leopold Senghor of Senegal and was watching a play. In Paris, the purchased information had been stri oh, 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 sorry. At seven in the morning the next day, the Puchists hightailed it to Radio Algiers and announced that they had taken control, of Al taken control of Algeria and the Sahara. They had arrested local administrators. In Paris, another general and six officers who were to melt in with the Puchists once they arrived in Paris were arrested. At 5 p.m., de Gaulle called a meeting of the French Council of Ministers. Uh, and he summed up the pooch. Uh, he said something very Gaullian, and uh, a statement meant for posterity, simple and to the point. Gentlemen, what is serious about this, fa this affair is that it is not serious. Ce n'est pas sérieux. At 5 p.m. Uh, the following day, on Sunday, the 23rd of April, General Salon arrived in Algiers from Spain, joined the Puchists, but refused to, harm, to arm the civilian activists. At 8 p.m., President de Gaulle appeared in his 1940s vintage military uniform on television, calling on French military personnel and civilians in metropolitan France and in Algeria to oppose the Puch. This was a time when everyone was experimenting uh, with transistor radios. So the conscripted soldiers were able to listen to de Gaulle, and having heard him, they refused en masse to follow the Puchist general's orders. Trade unions called a one-hour-long general strike. Finally, on the 26th of April, General Schall gave himself up. The press called the whole show the Battle of the Transistors. But it wasn't over. The remains of the Puchists, having escaped to Spain, Franco was still in power at the time, were later to return to Algiers clandestinely. They formed what is known as the OAS, the Organisation de l'Armée Secrète. It was constituted essentially by former colonels and generals Jouot, Salon, and Gardi. They also set up a branch in metropolitan France under the authority of a captain and a lieutenant. They didn't have a sophisticated structure or platform except to bring together all those who were, uh, 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 who were ready to act under the banner of French Algeria. They were aware of their vulnerability, a simple reason to become more extreme and violent. Their hate for de Gaulle, considered a traitor to their cause, was overwhelming and mobilizing. They provided themselves with uniforms and weapons, cars, phony papers through army contacts and passageways. In France, they carried out holdups and, send up, uh, and sent out threatening letters and notices. In Algiers, they became the terrorists, setting off explosions, carrying out a policy of terre brûlée, scorch earth, and, setting, and simply shooting down Algerians in the streets of the cities, including veiled women, their own maids. They engaged in what they called ratonade, so that the population would remember them. On September 23rd, 1961, they called the people to their windows and balconies with their pots and pans in hand in order that they be, their support be seen and heard. It was so successful in the European quarters that they employed the same tactic for many nights following. The defense of Algérie Française was picked up by the French right, by those who regretted Pétain and Vichy, those who favored a white civilization, and by Catholic fundamentalists. Finally, referendums in France and Algeria showed clearly that the populations of the two countries wanted no more of war. A date was set for independence, July 5, 1962, and the Army de Libération Nationale entered the city. The OAS had to stop its operations and disappeared along with 900,000 European settlers. A military court condemned Generals Schall and Zeller to 15 years in prison. However, five years later, they were freed, and their status in the military was restored. 
Salon and Jouot escaped and were condemned to death. However, in 1968, they were granted amnesty, and in 1982, they were reintegra reintegrated into the army. The last item on my list to remember is in the present. President Emmanuel Macron has stated unequivocally that colonization in Algeria was, I quote, a war against humanity. He also acknowledged that the French authorities were guilty of state-authorized torture during the Algerian war. It was a system, he stated. France still bears the scars, he added, sometimes badly closed. Even after France lost the war and left Algeria, it would not call what had happened there a war. They were the events until three decades after it had ended. Um, you perhaps are wondering why I, I lingered over these messy, in some cases, inhuman events. Because they're events that are sufficiently close to us in numerous ways. These are events we can manage in our heads, even imagine in or by our own countries. I feel it is useful to recall what we are capable of, how barely human. That's it. <laughs> And the, I mean, the struggle with that memory continues. I mean, even though um, the, the French government recently acknowledged uh, the, uh, the murder, the assassination and disappearance of the mathematician uh, Maurice Audin, uh, recently um, uh, Alain Juppé, the mayor of Bordeaux, said that a street could not be named after Franz Fanon. Oh. This happened uh, because his... his um, because he was, a, he was a divisive figure who did not represent consensual French values. Um, I want to play something for you um, just to kind of get us in the mood of 1969 Algeria. Um, we are still black and we have come back. New song, revenue. We have come back and brought back to our Land, Africa, the music of Africa. That's Archie Shep <laughs> at the 1969 Pan African Festival, which you played a part in putting together. Does that yes, I stir some it. memories? I worked on it. Uh, in fact, I was the one who wrote the letter to Archie. <laughs> There's no one else spoke English. And um, I saw Archie last weekend. He gave a concert in Washington. He's in his 80s now. It was a beautiful <coughs> concert. And um, that was the, at the Pan African Festival. It was a unique event, really unique. Um, I don't think there's any been, ever been anything like it since. It brought together 31 countries from Africa. They all sent delegations of musicians, of theater people, of singers, and um, intellectuals. And um, there were about six liberation movements um, from Mozambique and Angola and South Africa. They were all fighting for their independence at the time. And um, the. Streets of Algiers were packed with musicians and singers and dancers, and every night in the theaters there were um, uh, performances. And in the city squares there were set, there were setups of uh, boxing-like uh, arenas, and where people played. Uh, Archie played till two and three in the morning, and a number of Americans came, uh, jazz musicians came, and Nina Simone was there, Mar Miriam McCabe. And just before the, just before the, um, it lasted, I guess, about almost two weeks. And uh, there were events all over town. I think there were 60,000 participants. And um, there were, every night until 2, 3 in the morning, veiled women and children uh, out in the streets of Algiers. They'd never, se never seen anything like it. And then uh, 
there was a symposium alongside the Pan-African Festival. There was a symposium on economic development and social development, and cultural development was considered part of, uh, part of the future. And um, uh, what else can I say? It was about? a period of great optimism. You know, oh, it, was four, it was four years after, after the uh, Boumediene's military coup against the Ben Bella government, which you worked for. Yeah. Um, but it, nevertheless, it was still a period of great optimism, and Algeria was kind of the mecca of revolutionaries in the third world. Well, th there was no other country in Africa that could have organized such an event. Uh, it was impossible. Uh, uh, Algeria not only decided that it uh, was the politically in, uh, involved with the creation of the organization of African unity, but uh, financially it was a very it was a very expensive uh, production, and it was uh, beautifully carried out by a country of uh, mainly uh, very few uh, trained people. Uh, I sh should mention in passing that um, when Algeria, uh, Algeria became independent in 1962, it was over 90% illiterate. After 132 years of French colonialism, there were only 500 university graduates in the entire country. So that delegations came from all over the world to sort of help out and build to attempt to build a country. And this African, Pan-African festival was sort of a culmination of all of these efforts. And the man who organized it, Mohammed bin Yahya, was the Minister of Information. I was working in the, I worked in the Ministry of Information at the time. Can you talk a little bit about um, how you became, quote unquote, Algerianized, how you awakened to uh, uh, the problem of French colonialism. I th you, in your book, you talk about this May 1952 as being a kind of pivotal moment for you. Can, can you talk a little bit about that? Well, um, I, I went to France in, 19, in December 1951 uh, on a trip just to see what, the other world, what the, another part of the world was like. And um, I hadn't been there very long when um, there was the May Day Parade in 1952. And um, it, was, it was an amazing event with floats and uh, or, all of the French organizations, the national organizations uh, had floats and it was endless. It went on for hours and hours. Jacques Lucro was the head of the, of the Communist Party at the time, and he was cheered, and, and there were demonstrations of, for the different organizations of uh, auto workers and school teachers and so on. And at the end of the parade, it was over, practically over, all of a sudden, out of nowhere, came a stream of men, uh, about 12 across the, the, the street in Paris, this avenue in Paris, was their arms splayed. Um, uh, they were running to catch up with the parade, and they were endless. They kept coming and coming and coming. I don't know how many hundreds or th even thousands there were. And they were all Algerian workers. It was only then that I realized that um, there was a problem somewhere. <laughs> uh, uh, that was the first time that I had realized the, what French colonialism was and uh, you could see from these young these men they were all they were young and vibrant and poorly dressed and without banners without any kind of identification everybody knew who they were and uh, it became uh, after that I became aware of uh, the Algerian workers in France and uh, the bidonville the shanty towns outside of Paris and so on it, then it all started becoming quite clear to me. And then when you came back to New York, you ended up working for the FLN office and developing a, a friendship right. and then a relationship with uh, uh, Mohamed Safnoun. Well, yes. Uh, I met alongside Fanon in, uh, in Accra. I met Mohamed Safnoun, who was later a um, member of the uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And at the time, he was a student, had just gotten out of prison. 
uh, he had been working with a social group in Algiers, uh, which was, um, he was, the entire group was, uh, it was a, it was a French Algerian attempt at friendship. And they were all arrested, tortured, and imprisoned. And when he got out of prison, he was sent, uh, he got a scholarship to the United States. And he went to New York University. And I met him in Ghana as the head of the Algerian delegation uh, alongside Fanon. There were the two of them. And um, we became quite friendly. And um, back in New York, after the conference was over in, in Accra, uh, I went back to see my parents. And um, so I stopped in New York and I saw him, and he introduced me to the Algerian office, which was the FLN, ALN, and it, wasn't yet, it was the, already the provisional government of Algeria. Their office uh, for um, UN delegations, they attempted to influence uh, the United Nations every year. There was a, a, a resolution introduced at the United Nations for Algerian independence. And um, this was an office that uh, worked with the United Nations, but also worked with, uh, with uh, American organizations and as a, a way of introducing the struggle that was going on in Algeria, because in, in the United States it was quite ignored that there was a war going on that had been going on for years and went on for seven and a half years. And we did our best to mm -hmm. inform the uh, Americans, American people, and the United Nations especially. And I th many people consider that the uh, work that was done at the United Nations, the resolution, early resolutions and so on, uh, were essential to Algerian independence. That okay. finally, uh, if, if de Gaulle finally gave up, it was because of the United Nations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it played a pivotal role. There's a very good history by uh, historian Matthew Connolly about, oh, about the diplomacy of, of, the, of that office. Um, and to some extent, the role that, that that office played in securing independence was obscured by the myth of the armed struggle. Yeah. So much emphasis was placed on the armed struggle that people forgot that there was a whole political and diplomatic struggle. It was an international struggle. I mean, and uh, I think the Algerians, when they set up the provisional government, they sent ambassadors around the world. Uh, per, some, most of them, some of them permanent, some of them uh, provisional. Uh, and they were very aware of the importance of, the, of an international support because of, um, after all, they were fighting against uh, the fourth most powerful nation in the world. And they were a ragtag army. They started out with um, scout knives <laughs> and uh, a few, uh, a few guns, and so they were very much aware of the need for support around the world. So, and being um, an American was was a, a kind of improbable advantage in your friendship with Fanon. Can you talk a bit about that? Oh yeah, well, Fanon was uh, uh, he was a um, a man who was very conscious of relationships and what they could mean. Um, he was, after all, he was not Algerian. He was Mart from Martinique. Um, he was very aware of his special status as an amb uh, ambassador of Algeria. And uh, when we first met, uh, was on the campus of the University of Accra. And he was with three other Algerians. Uh, they were looking for the Congress that I was uh, working on. And uh, he asked in uh, very weak French, uh, weak English, where the conference was taking place. And I answered, I caught his accent immediately, and I answered in French. And he thought I was French, and so rather stiff. <laughs> but then when he realized I was American, uh, Everything changed. <laughs>
1962, you, after independence, you, you went to Algeria for the first time. Um, what were your first impressions of the country? Oh, it was, uh, it's hard to say, I mean, everything, everything lacked. Um, but at the same time, everyone was very enthusiastic. And there were delegations that came from all over the world, I think, from as far away as China and Russia and uh, even, even French delegations of uh, French people who had supported Algerian uh, independence. And um, we all felt very much a part of uh, this new nation. And we felt that we were in the process of changing the world. And um, we felt that whatever we contributed uh, was building, it was a building block, that we were uh, on our way to a new world a world where people understood each other, where men and women would be uh, would be helped along the way with education, housing, health, and so on. We were convinced that this was the beginning, and that with Algeria being so strong, uh, that we would join in with other countries and and transform things. Yeah. <laughs> um, can you talk a little bit about what you did uh, for the Ben Bella government? Because you, you were hired early on to work with their Ministry of Information, I think. Um, uh, no, I was. Uh, I worked in Ben Bella's office yeah. in the beginning. Yeah. What were you? What were you doing? I, I was in the press office. Mm -hmm. I was in the press office. And, um, uh, there was a reception one day, and I uh, was introduced to Sheriff Galal. And um, Sheriff Galal uh, heard my accent and said, uh, where are you from? I said I was from New York. And um, a few days later, he showed up at the office that I was working at, which was a tourist office. Uh, and the, yes, it was the tourist office. He showed up and asked me if I would come and work with him at the uh, press office. That he uh, was, would be happy to have someone speaking English. So I worked in Ben Miller's press office. We met, we, you know, we had a lot of uh, journalists were arriving. They wanted to see this new country. And this was in 1962, so, or 63, yeah. Now sometime later, after Ben Bella is, is, is overthrown and when he's in house arrest, mm. under house arrest, um, a close friend of yours was summoned by him. Can you talk a bit about that? Uh, oh, yeah. It's, uh, well, um, uh, I was working at a certain time, I worked, at, as I told you before, I was working in the Ministry of Information with uh, a, a small group. On the, we worked on the uh, Pan-African Cultural Festival. And when the Pan-African Cultural Festival was over, we were asked to put out a magazine, which would be sort of the face of Algeria in the world. And so the, one of the members of the group was a woman by the name of Zora Salami. And Zora and I became very close friends, uh, intimate friends. And um, one day uh, Zora was uh, asked by a former uh, minister of uh, Bembelas. He was in prison by then. He had been overthrown. Um, he was asked, she was asked if she, if she would be uh, uh, a candidate for marriage with Ben Bella in prison. And she accepted. She went to see him and talked with him and said yes. And the marriage took place without Ben Bella, of course, and um, in Zora's family home. But as a result, um, Zora could not be a prisoner. She was, there was, she would spend three weeks with Bembella and one week in Algiers. And when she came to Algiers, she would look me up and another, uh, and a couple of other friends, and we would take her shopping, uh, take her around, and go out to dinner, things like that. And 
Of course, the military police didn't exactly appreciate all this. And they tried to get me to find, uh, to inform on them, on, on Zora, which I found uh, impossible to do. <laughs> she was my friend. So this went on, they would periodically call me in and ask me if I would do, uh, if I would spy on her and inform them. And I would each time tell them, no, that was impossible, and so on, so on. And finally, this led to my ex uh, expulsion. Uh, expulsion from Algeria. Mm -hmm. um, let's talk a bit about the Black Panthers and about okay. the arrival of Eldridge Cleaver um, from Cuba. Um, he nearly was sent back, wasn't he? Uh, the, it was partly thanks to your. Um, well, he was. He came. He was told by the Cubans. Well, Eldridge uh, spent about five months in Cuba. Uh, he left the United States because there was a man out for his arrest, and he was determined not to go back to prison. Um, he knew the danger of it, and um, so he. he he arranged to go to Cuba. And he spent five months there, and the Cubans were very nervous with that sort of, with the, with, uh, with the personality uh, of uh, uh, that importance uh, to the American scene, and someone who wanted by American justice. So uh, they told him, they convinced him to go to Algeria. They told him that arrangements had been made with the Algerian authorities. And when he arrived, the only person at the airport was a Cuban uh, embassy official. And uh, the Cuban told him that uh, the Algerians hadn't agreed to, uh, that he stay in their country and that they were sending him on to the Middle East. And his wife, uh, Eldridge's wife was there. She was eight months pregnant. Um, Somebody called me from the uh, Zimbabwe African People's Union, uh, which was one of the liberation organizations that had a seat in Algiers. And he said to me, he told me that Eldred was in Algiers and needed help. And would I go see him? So I went to see him, and he told me his story. So I, I knew the head of the liberation office of the National Liberation Front, <laughs> Sleeman Huffman. And I, so I called Sleeman Huffman. I told him that Eldridge Cleaver was in town. And uh, he said, well, that's very nice. He can, have, he can stay. <laughs> he hadn't been informed uh, by the Cubans that Eldridge was on his way to Algiers. So as a result, I became sort of an intermediary between the Algerian government and the Black Death Party. The relationship between the Black Panther Party in Algiers and the Algerian government was a pretty complicated dance, wasn't it? Yes, well, it became complicated after a while. In the beginning, it was very simple, and they were very privileged. They got a villa, which there were, there were many, many liberation organizations had offices in Algiers, and, and the Algerian government gave them a lot, gave them uh, uh, political support, gave them papers, trained uh, freedom fighters for them. Um, uh, gave, uh, yes, so th there were, uh, it was, um, it was a, uh, a very positive outlook towards um, liberation movements. And when the Panthers arrived, they were wholeheartedly welcomed. And, um, uh, they were given a villa, which was rather rare, in El Biar. And um, they were helped with, the, with papers to tra so they could travel. Uh, they received a financial stipend every month. Um, the relationship was, was good. It became sour after a couple of years. And it became sour because of uh, there were some international hijackings. Uh, there was first there was a there was a plane a Delta airline plane. No, I guess no, it wasn't Delta. Delta was the second one. First one I was in another. I can't remember which. 
at any rate, uh, uh, the first uh, hijacking was uh, done in the United States by um, a, f a former uh, Vietnam uh, a member of the U.S. Army in Vietnam and his girlfriend. And uh, they got $500,000 to release the passengers, and they landed in Algiers. And Eldridge and two other Panthers and I went to the airport. <laughs> it was a memorable experience. <laughs> we were on the tar actually on the tarmac, and the plane landed, and the Algerians were counting on us <laughs> to make things happen nicely. <laughs> At any rate, um, of course, the Algerian government took the $500,000, and they returned it to the airlines. Uh, it was a normal procedure. The Panthers were not happy about that. No, the Panthers were not happy at all. <laughs> and uh, but this was normal procedure. Otherwise, they would have been the, the uh, they they would have been the um, pariah state, and no no international uh, pilot would have flown into Algiers. There's no doubt about that. And they want the pilot International Pilots Association warned them that they didn't give the back the money that this was what was going to happen. So that was, and uh, there were a whole group of uh, black Americans in um, in Detroit, and um, who were uh, living under assumed conditions because uh, two of them had um, escaped from prison, and one had escaped from the U.S. Army and their wives and their children. They read about those two uh, uh, first air pilot, pirates, that they had been accepted in Algeria, because Algeria gave them asylum status. Uh, but they hadn't read that they had returned the money. <laughs> and so they asked for a million dollars. <laughs> and they got a million dollars from the airlines. And they arrived in Algiers, and the Algerian government took the million dollars <laughs> <laughs> and returned it to the airlines. <laughs> but they allowed these eight people to stay in Algeria and in an exile uh, asylum, uh, a status. They were free. They gave, turned them over to the Black Panther Party. And uh, the Black Panther Party was very unhappy. <laughs> And they wrote a letter, a scandalous letter, to Boumediene, accusing him of not helping. Betraying the revolution. <laughs> yes. I mean, you, you suggest that, the, that Eldridge, for all of his qualities, um, and the Panthers didn't really go to much trouble to understanding the country that they were living in. No, they didn't, they didn't understand Algeria at all. I don't think so. Um, they were... Um, they operated on their own. They didn't. They didn't read the press. They didn't watch the TV. They didn't. Uh, they knew some Algerian women, uh, but um, they sound like ordinary Americans abroad. Yeah. In fact, Eldridge once said, once accused them of thinking they were in Harlem. <laughs> um, and uh, so th there was no back and forth, really except uh, they were allowed to, to, to do their thing, which was have press conferences or have, uh, have uh, comrades coming into Algeria. They, the Algerians gave them uh, papers and they could travel and so on. But, um, Can you talk a bit about, um, there's, a, there's a chilling uh, episode in, in your book which kind of marks your not your estrangement from the from the Panthers, but to some extent your disillusionment um, when Eldridge Cleaver comes back one evening and tells you that he did something. He came to my office one morning. He came to my office, um, and I was in an office with. Uh, I shared an office with three or four other people, and he came to my office and he sat down. And he said to me. I killed Rahim last night. Rahim was a member of his group, and he killed him. 
It was a terrible moment. And um, he told me, and he got up and he left. And um, the body was found uh, the following week. Uh, it was turned over to the Algerian police. I don't believe they knew at the time who had killed this man, but they knew that it was an Afro-American because of the Afro that he had and the tattoos and so on. Yeah, and it was, I think that Aldridge kept it from, kept the murder from his colleagues, but he told me because he was, he feared that um, the Algerian police would come down on him and he needed somebody to decide. Yeah. And the Algerian police never questioned the Panthers about the, the death of the American. And yet, at the same time, you pay tribute to, to Cleaver, to Aldrich well, Cleaver, at least. I mean, he had qualities that he had were a lot of admirable, qualities. right? I mean, he, he, was a, he, was a, he was bigger than life. Uh, he, was a, he was a big man, and he, was, he, he knew how to think. He knew how to write, and uh, he knew how to speak. And um, he and I sort of got along, and um, uh, there was no, no, no sort of intimate relationship, but just, just we got along, we understood each other, we could talk to each other, he could tell me uh, his problems and the problems he had with members of his group and different things. And, he could show me his texts that he was writing, or, and I could criticize them. And it was oh, just a very good working relationship. And the last time you saw him was in Paris. Right? Was in Paris, yes. When he was, he was living in Paris at the time. Yes. Well, at uh, one point, after the second hijacking, uh, the Panthers had lost ground in the, in the United States by then. And... Uh, there were a lot of problems, and the, the organization had lost its power. And so the group in Algiers felt that uh, they as individuals had to decide what their fate would be. And many of them were married or had wives and children and so on. And so each, each one sort of had to organize his own life. Um, and Eldridge had to organize his. So he decided, he just decided uh, that he would go to France. So we had to get him into France, and we did. <laughs> uh, I organized a, a series of, uh, trip of people who would take him from Algiers into Tunisia, from Tunisia into Switzerland, from Switzerland to France, and he got into France. Uh, and uh, he must have stayed in France for about a year or a little over a year, and he then negotiated his return to the United States mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. with two FBI officials. The, the Panther leader who comes across more impressively in your book is Don Cox. Oh, yes. There's a book coming out very, uh, I think it's coming out now, uh, this month. Uh, the, Don Cox's memoir. Mm -hmm. And uh, Don Cox was the, uh, called the field marshal of the Black Panther Party. He was the military man. And he was the man who set up the, uh, an underground system of um, hideouts and arms and so on. And he had to leave the United States at one point because he was being looked for. And he came to Algiers, and uh, he and I were very good friends. We became very good friends. And um, when he realized that things were, were over for the Panthers, in a sense, um, he, too, he, he stayed in Algeria for four years and worked for a national company in Algeria. And then he decided to come to France, and he came to France. And I helped him get uh, French um, papers. Uh, the same uh, source that had given me, helped me get papers, and it was basically uh, from um, the man who was head of the radio in France. Yeah. Hi. 
My, uh, my, my colleague and friend Jeremy Harding writes that your book is a clear-eyed, first-hand recollection of the way things fall apart, but, uh, which it is. But at the same time, it's, a, it's an account of how, how things come together. It is a portrait of a period of great of solidarity, romanticism, yeah. um, and very moving for that. And I'm wondering, was, was that what led you to write this memoir? What, what, how did, what, you, because you, you waited a, a while to write this book. Oh, what, I what waited led a long to, time, yeah. yes. I waited an awful <laughs> long time. I, I just didn't feel competent, that's all. And um, it's as simple as that. A, a friend who lives in my building in, in New York, saying that, um, she every time I would see her, she'd say, when are you starting to write your book? And uh, I said, no, never. <laughs> I didn't feel that I was capable of it. At any rate, Mokhtar, my husband, started to write his memoir of his youth and his time in the uh, Algerian Liberation Army. And uh, so as a result, I sat down and I started to write also. And just Interestingly, he, he knew Fanon too, but had a much a much less positive opinion of him than you did. Oh, yes, he yeah, didn't he have met him when he was in Tunis, <laughs> right? With the well, a lot of Algerians don't have a very yeah. strong opinion yeah. of Fanon. Yeah. yeah. Um, I want to make sure that we have enough time for questions, so maybe we should, we should okay. stop here. Yeah. Um, uh, do any of you have questions? <coughs> yes. <laughs> huh. uh, why don't you first, and then you, you asked a question. And then, Sorry, yeah. question. Uh, he asked the first question, this woman here, and then... Yeah. <coughs> Thank you. Um, I'm just going to uh, pick up at the last point you just made about Algerians um, not having a strong position, uh, sort of views of Fanon, and I was wondering whether you could elaborate on this. Well, uh, I mean, I, if I look at what Mohamed Harbi says, Mohamed Harbi is a, more or less the chief Algerian uh, historian of the period of the war. And before the war, he's a man in his 80s today. And uh, Harvey says that he felt that Fanon hadn't understood uh, the Algerians and hadn't understood the importance of religion. That uh, Fanon felt that liberation was a liberating force for everything, including religion. And um, Harvey knew that it wasn't. So. Uh, he, uh, he felt that Fanon uh, was a romantic and uh, believed that uh, uh, the sort of, what was it, the communist song? Um, uh, I can't remember now. International. Yeah, the international, thanks. That, uh, that, that Fanon was singing the international when he hadn't really looked at the life of the Algerian people. He was also very critical of the emphasis on the revolutionary spontaneity of the, of the peasantry um, and, and argued that, in fact, the peasants were not the primary component of the ALN. He, he, sort of, he develops these critiques in his book, Algeria, Myth and Reality, and also in the... Uh, in the uh, afterword to the French edition of uh, Retro of the Earth. Mm. So, I mean, his, he's written extensively on this. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Um. Hello. First of all, uh, if I can say thank you, great privilege to read your book. Uh -huh. It was an incredible uh, opportunity to Thanks. have a glimpse at quite alive. Um, I wonder if I may move you one of the things in the book that really touched me. Uh, I spent a lot of time in Cuba over the last 20, 30 years. Not quite as you, but uh, of course in your book you mentioned your first trip to Havana, the Pan-Africanism. Oh, yeah. was also Caribbean Pan-Africanism, the Cuban involvement in Africa is well known. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me that aside from a few old communists who've uh, passed to a different life, you're one of the very few people left from those early trips. There was Jean Paul Sartre at the same time as you and Simone de Beauvoir, perhaps in Havana. Now, second part of the question, as you know, there is a number of uh, Black Panthers living in Cuba, Asata Kapoor, uh, mostly. I think she's been there Asata now. Asata Shakur. Asata Shakur has been there now for about uh, 35 years. <laughs> but when you talk about the disillusion of these great Pan-African ideals, Havana, the Cuban revolution still going on 60 years on, 
Could you just talk a little bit about this? Sorry, I've thrown uh, you quite yeah, a lot. I, mean, I don't know Cuba very well, but um, I did go there in 1967 uh, with Josie Fanon. And um, we, uh, we spent six weeks in Cuba. There was a, a meeting called the OLAS, the Organization of Latin American Solidarity, was taking place. And uh, it was ex very exciting. It was a very exciting time, and, at the, uh, and Cuba uh, was really on the up. And um, we listened to Fidel talk about, uh, uh, for hours, uh, talk about, uh, <laughs> um, it was amazing. Yeah. He would, uh, we heard him talk, criticize the Soviet Union for having uh, 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 come together with Latin American countries that were opposed to Cuba. And uh, it was uh, quite something. He was, um, he uh, had time for everyone. And uh, at that meeting, there was Stokely Carmichael, who was the, uh, an American, a black American, uh, who had been head of the um, SNCC, SNCC uh, the student, uh, student organization of Afro-Americans. And um, he was uh, sitting next to Fidel at, the, at all the meetings. And he had a famous press conference and so on. And, it was there that I, I met uh, Stokely and got the Algerian delegation to invite him to Algeria. And uh, it, it was, we were taken everywhere. We, we were very impressed with uh, the medical situation. The Cuban uh, medical services were absolutely extraordinary, better than in the United States. And um, this was just, what, eight years after, not even, no, six, six years after the Cuban Revolution. And we act I actually uh, saw Fidel close up one night. You know, there was a big reception at an enormous hall, and it was over. And we were all leaving when he walked in. And there was a small um, Chilean delegation and Josie and me, and we were just leaving. And Fidel came in, he stood right there, and, he, and the Chileans said to him, Comandante, um, what should we do to make a revolution in Chile? And he, he, said, he stood there and he said, Il faut faire, uh, uh, no, no, sorry, I'm speaking French. Uh, hay que hacer la revolución. Hay que hacer la revolución. Hay que hacer la revolución. And they st stood there and they watched him and he, he repeated it twice. And then he walked away. <laughs> <laughs> it was uh, quite amazing. And now, what do you think of now? Oh, I think it's, well, I think the role of the United States has been absolutely abominable. Yeah. Um, we've, we've thwarted the, the capacity for revolution. We've opened up, the, opened up a passageway to Cuba, and now we're closed it again with Trump. Um, I, it's terrible what we've done to that country. And they, they, haven't, they, haven't, um, they haven't drowned. They're still alive, and they're still... Uh, there may be all sorts of criticisms and so on, but they're, they're still alive, and we weren't able to sink them. We tried desperately. <laughs> this woman here has a question. Thank you. Um, what an exciting life you've had, and what a wonderful book you've uh, written. Um, I read the article in New Left Review, and of course I was so excited about this uh, talk. Um, I, um, in the late 1970s, I was active in um, the Iranian student movement. I was a graduate student in, in Washington, D.C. at the time, and I, I had the pleasure of meeting Stokely Carmichael, who uh, by that time was Kwame Ture, and um, he was heading the All-African People's Revolutionary Party. And um, by that time, too, um, 
in comparison to um, uh, Stokely Carmichael, who I thought was so impressive on so many different levels, Eldridge Cleaver had um, <coughs> struck me as someone who was crude, sexist, and misogynistic. Um, so that's one question that I have. I've had many thoughts. <coughs> yeah. Um, so I wonder if that was a side of him that you saw. Um, in our <laughs> oh, yes. <yeah. laughs> Never. <laughs> he concealed it brilliantly. <laughs> Yeah, uh, he also question? had many qualities, but he, he, he was, it's for, no, no doubt about it, he was very sexist. <coughs> he was also um, very anti-gay. Um, unlike Huey Newton. Unlike Huey Newton was yes. uh, very pro-gay rights. Yeah. yeah. He was, um, he had uh, extreme faults and he put them, he, he put them out in the open. Uh, he wasn't afraid of them. He, I think he thought that he was all, that had some kind of, uh, he was all powerful. He could express his uh, views of women, of gays, and so on, and that it wouldn't have any effect. Uh, he was wrong, but it, yeah. Uh, Eldridge had many def defects, but he also was very. We have two questions well, in the oh, back can I, here. Can I just ask oh. that, that second question about, uh, about Algerian feminism? Um, because I, I have a lot of Algerian feminist friends who have had a kind of um, more uh, sober view of the revolution. Um, in the late 1990s, I asked one Algerian friend who uh, I met at a, um, I, I ran into at a conference in Cyprus, and I was wondering about that terrible civil conflict of the 1990s and how very, very violent it was and where that violence came yes, from. You see, I and was, her answer to me that's was... That's not my period. No, okay, no, but her answer to me was Notre Revolution était très, très violente. Ah. Is that something that you also uh, Well, that, it was very different when I was there. Uh, I lived in Algeria from 1962, the year of independence, to 1974. I lived there for 12 years. And um, there, uh, women were, try were trying desperately to come into their own, and many of them did. And young women took off the veils and uh, they were very, felt very free. So uh, things changed afterwards, uh, and I, I wasn't present, so I really can't talk about that. Uh, we have two questions back here, though. Um, uh, your question was first, and then your um, hello. First of all, thank you, not only for tonight, but for your involvement in Algerian independence. Um, it's really, really rare to be able to have one person between yourself and Franz Fanon, so that's quite incredible. Uh, my question is very simple, actually. Is how now that you've been involved since the beginning of how Alger, Alger and Algerian itself became the maker of revolutionaries, and I feel it's something that is quite well forgotten uh, in not only our own countries, I mean in North Africa and the rest of the, of the Middle East, uh, but also in Europe, in Latin America, in Asia, and in the US. Even though the, all of those regions and all of those countries were once involved uh, in either the Algerian conflict or in Algeria as being the maker of revolutionaries. Um, it's not only my generation, and I know as a French Algerian why we, are, we don't know about it, because we're not taught about, um, about Algeria. And as you said, it's very true in the French history books in high schools and middle schools, it's not called the war of Algeria, it's called the events of Algeria. And the only fact in it, it's the 9th May attack of Setif. Uh, we don't learn about anything else, and especially not about October uh, 17, 1961, even though a lot of us in France are very much concerned with what happened in Algeria and what still remains in our society because of Algeria. So back to the, my point, how would you feel or what, how would you explain the reason why Algeria has been forgotten as being the maker of revolutionaries beyond people that were involved at this time in very much political activism and let's say it's communism. But again, thank you, it's such an honor. <laughs> I'm not sure I, I, think she, I, think, I think she wanted to know why do you think Algeria's role and stature uh, as the mecca of revolutionaries um, in the 60s and 70s, why has that oh. been forgotten? Well, it's a hard question to answer, but I think that if, if that I can say anything about it is that um, at some point, uh, 
the uh, Algerian authorities weren't able to meet the needs of their people. And um, population exploded. When I went there, there were uh, about uh, maybe nine or 10 million people. Today, there are almost 50 million. Um, and so that the demands of the people of, uh, for a better life were difficult to meet. Furthermore, uh, in about, I guess it was probably about in the 1980s, um, the price of oil, which uh, Algeria is a one, one product country. It's oil and gas, it's pure, that's it. Uh, at some point in time, uh, probably in the 70s, uh, they started importing food. And you have to pay for it, you know, bank loans and so on. That there was an increasing national debt. Plus the fact that, in, I think it was about in the 1980s somewhere, the price of oil dropped from 20 something dollars a gallon, I think it was $25 a gallon, down to 12. And this was their only revenue. So they were no longer able to meet the mm -hmm. needs of people. Uh, I, I, think, I think that's I think, one of the major things. I think she's asking a question more about memory. You know, oh. and why, and I, I, if you don't mind, I mean, I, oh, yeah. I, I, I would suggest that it's partly that Algeria itself became much more inward looking in the late Boumedian years, and, oh, that, sure. this, and that this tendency, if anything, increased under Chadli Benjadid. Yeah. Um, Algeria became a much left, much less of a left-leaning, uh, third-worldist uh, country, and turned increasingly towards a kind of cultural conservatism, and meanwhile, other struggles took the place of the Algerian struggle. The Palestinian struggle became what the Algerian struggle had been in the 1950s and 60s. So I, I think it's partly owing to, to changes within Algeria and partly owing to the fact that other struggles were more at the center stage of the world. And of course, uh, France has its own reasons for uh, suppressing this memory. I mean, as, as Elaine uh, mentioned earlier, it was only in 1998 that France even admitted that there had been a war. And it was only earlier uh, this year or late last year that France couldn't even could even concede that it had murdered Maurice Audin. I mean, and and because France has this uh, very complicated relationship to people who are French citizens, but who are the the grandchildren and great grandchildren of colonized Algerians, the country is even less willing to acknowledge uh, the violence that it committed in that country for yeah. well over a century. So it's uh, I mean that's a. a uh, that, that forgetting is not, uh, there's nothing innocent about that forgetting. Um, Thanks, Sam. Thank you very much, Elaine. It's an honor to be here. Um, I actually reviewed your book for the TLS, and I only wish I could have heaped more praise on it. Um, I just wanted to get back to Adam's point about how some reviews have pointed out it's a, it's a memoir of sort of how things fall apart. Um, I find that those who do mention that fixate on this notion of there were too many differences in the end um, amongst the different um, groups and the different agendas of the government of Algeria versus these groups to ever um, make the third world is sort of internationalist dream come true. But your memoir shows how solidarities were forged despite and sometimes thanks to differences. I wondered if you can recall some instances or anecdotes where um, for instance, the Pan-African Festival, where differences amongst these groups were worked through in productive ways and led to strengthened solidarities. That's a good question. Um, yeah, I'm not sure I could answer it. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, I think that the Pan-African Cultural Festival was an attempt to, to meet some of those differences. Uh, North Africa has always been separated from uh, from uh, Black Africa, south of the Sahara, and uh, Algeria made a when they decided to organize this festival. I think that this was in in their mind that Algeria had to join Africa uh, and had already by helping liberation movements to. Uh, set, uh, to uh, settle in Algeria, they helped liberation movements. Uh, train, they trained people for them. They trained soldiers. They trained propagandists. They trained 
uh, whatever, they, they met the needs of those uh, organizations. And the Pan-African Festival was, attempt, was an attempt, in addition to what it was uh, for, for culture in Africa, it was a way of Algeria becoming closer to uh, black Africa, to bringing them together. That, I think that's one of the most important events that took place. Um, and you talk about, in your book, you talk about the reaction of some Algerians to the, um, to, to uh, African performances, to women oh, yeah. exhibiting themselves oh, in so ways that Algerians weren't accustomed I to. Mean, but it wasn't merely shock, it was fascination, <laughs> it was pleasure, and it was... It was amazing because uh, in Algeria women were very uh, enclosed in many ways. And um, there were African women with uh, their breasts out in the open, uh, dancing in the streets. <laughs> And uh, people were fascinated. They'd never seen such a thing. It was absolutely fascinating. And I, was, I looked at a film recently of the, of the Pan-African Festival. There's one on YouTube that's very good. And uh, there you see these Afri African women um, uh, with uh, dancing. And I think later this year, um, yeah. a new edition of the film that William Klein, the great American photographer, made at the Pan-African Festival, it's being reissued. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. maybe. It's not the best film, but um, <laughs> it's a very dull film. <laughs> we have time for two more questions. I think you, were, you wanted to ask a question, and you wanted to ask a question. Uh, thank you for writing the book as an Indian with our own colonial past. It was very inspiring to read. Um, uh, one thing when I, when I read your book, one uh, I was reminded of Andre Alec's book, Algerian Memoirs, and, and how your book essentially complements his because his ends at the moment of independence and then you take up the story from there. Uh, so I was wondering if, if that book was in your mind when you were writing yours and, and there's a conversation between these two books uh, that they chronicle the time from the struggle to, you know, the later period. I, I, I was wondering about Henri Alleg's memoir, whether you had been thinking about Henri Alleg's memoir when oh. you wrote your book. No, it's, I read that so many years ago. No. No, uh, not the question. He, he, you know, not, he's not talking about the question. Oh. Um, but Alleg published a, a you're not talking about the question, are you? You're talking about the memoir that he wrote. He wrote a, he wrote a memoir of his experiences uh, much later, not about his torture, but about his whole political journey. Did you know? No, I've never read okay. it. Okay. Yeah. I haven't read it, no. I'm sorry, but I haven't read it. I read the question. <laughs> and, oh, and I think you had a question. Hi, I really enjoyed the book as well, as did everyone here. Um, but not to give away the end of the book, but in the conclusion, you go to Algiers after being away for decades. How was that trip for you? Oh, it was quite amazing. I, uh, it's a country I don't know anymore. Um, it's changed considerably. I didn't feel the same vibes. Um, you know, it's crowded. There are cars. Everyone has a car. Um, it's. Um, I don't feel that there's a pre there's a preoccupation with the future the way, except individual future. I I didn't didn't feel the uh, uh, collective project. It's very so. difficult. A sense of a collective project. No, I didn't feel that, that there was any, anyone was thinking in terms of Algeria as such anymore, that everyone was involved in their own story. And everyone has a combine, and everyone, uh, everyone has a car. Mm -hmm. It takes two hours to go 20 miles out of Algiers, if you can imagine. You sit in cars. <laughs> and uh, it's a very different country. It's a very different country with lots of people. At the same time, this memoir has connected you to so many 
interesting Algerian intellectuals and writers oh, and yeah. filmmakers. Yeah, I mean, your, your life has changed, right? You've become a kind of a star. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, somewhat. Um, but the book is going to come out in Algiers. And it's going to come out in France, too, in Paris. Yeah. It's being published by uh, Edition Barzac, uh, Algeria's best publisher, and, and by uh, La Fabrique, La Fabrique uh, oui. in, in Paris. Eric Cazan. Yeah. <coughs> and so it will come out in May in France and a little bit later in Algiers. Yeah. And um, it was a, I mean, it was a trip down memory lane, in a way. And uh, there are some things that can never change. Uh, Rudy Douche and Ruben Mahidi can't change. But uh, the rest of the outskirts, the suburbs, have changed. The green fields are no longer there. The, along the, along the uh, Mediterranean, it's all built up. We used to be able to walk in the fields and down to the water. Uh, it wasn't the Algeria that I'd known. Um, what could I say? <laughs> Thank you so much, Elaine.